Hello, my name is Jonathan Goldman. I'm an associate professor at UCLA. Thank you very much to Dr. Guerin and Dr. Langer for inviting me to speak on how to handle elk resistance. We'll look at the treatment options, the clinical and molecular factors in assessing resistance, and how to choose an optimal agent to treat resistance. Many trials have uh, looked at, at this uh, question and um, uh, beginning with sequential TKI therapy uh, soon after uh, crizotinib and the development of resistance, uh, we have looked at agents such as electinib and brigatinib with impressive response rates and duration of response, seritinib uh, with a uh, somewhat less activity. Um, the uh, particular benefit to electinib and brigatinib, at least in part uh, from the CNS activity, which is uh, quite similar to the systemic response rates. Following second generation drugs, electinib or brigatinib, uh, their uh, lorlatinib uh, demonstrated a meaningful response rate uh, but electinib and brigatinib, I'm sorry, seritinib and brigatinib uh, with less activity. Uh, although early evidence suggested that uh, pemetrexid had significant activity in ALK positive disease, it was in fact very difficult to find um, uh, data about response rates with chemotherapy following uh, either crizotinib or other ALK inhibitors. Uh, but if we look at the first line chemotherapy response rates uh, between 25 and 45 percent and progression free survivals of uh, seven to eight months, single agent drugs uh, were not associated with a particularly high benefit. Uh, and now the most recent data set comes from the Empower 150 trial with the quadruplet carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and atezolizumab, which included a small number of ALK positive patients uh, who may, uh, making up this uh, large uh, overall positive trial. So um, when I am looking at a patient with TKI resistant disease, often I'm considering a biopsy to assess the mechanisms of resistance and then considering among my options, locally ablative therapy and continuing the TKI, switching to a new TKI or switching to chemotherapy with or without immunotherapy, uh, possibly including anti-angiogenic therapy uh, or uh, some also uh, instead decide to continue the TKI with chemotherapy. How do we uh, choose among these options? I've decided to consider clinical features and molecular features. So beginning on the clinical side, uh, the, how's the patient doing performance status by, uh, by ECOG, but as well as uh, kind of your assessment of their activity level, whether that is decreasing rapidly, a uh, patient's appetite and weight, I think, are also meaningful indicators of uh, the pace of disease. Also, uh, the type of progression, CNS progression or, or systemic progression, oligo progression or multi-site progression. So moving on to the molecular features, um, uh, very soon it was realized that the different TKIs led to a different assortment of resistance mechanisms. Uh, per perhaps, first of all, it's important to note that there's no single dominant mutation causing resistance. Uh, and uh, although some of the important mutations such as G1202R are relatively rare after crizotinib with, uh, with later generation drugs, uh, that becomes more common. You can assess, uh, sorry, assemble a table such as this, looking at the resistance mutations that emerge uh, in the setting of different ALK inhibitors. And uh, it's probably important to think that this is just very well organized anecdotal data, uh, but it may suggest that if you don't see a resistance mutation in the setting of a certain TKI, that that TKI, TKI may have good benefit against that mutation. And how do we assess for the, for the mutations? Uh, certainly we have tumor biopsies, 
Uh, but liquid biopsies increasingly play a role. Several different types of liquid biopsies have been evaluated. And I think uh, clearly the one with the most clinical utility is cell-free DNA, uh, which can also be, circulating, be called circulating tumor DNA uh, when it's in the blood. Uh, Dr. Noor, uh, when he was a fellow, worked with me on uh, this paper and this diagram uh, uh, showing that a tumor biopsy uh, may assess at different points when it is feasible to do a biopsy, a single site of disease, but circulating tumor DNA due to its ease and, and low risk can uh, perhaps be done more serially, showing a decrease in um, allelic fraction of mutation on response and then an increase on progression. Uh, and as well, it can um, uh, be an assessment of mutations from multiple sites throughout the body, uh, perhaps giving a better single snapshot of disease. This sample is then evaluated by a highly uh, sensitive technique, um, either digital PCR or more often, uh, particularly in ALK disease with NGS testing. And uh, therefore, you can assemble a very uh, complex understanding of, um, of patients, uh, often presented among a few number of patients, but they can be instructive. On the right, you can see in, in the blue bars, the plasma analyses showing that uh, plasma is more likely to uh, pick up a resistance mechanism, uh, as well as uh, plasma is more likely to show multiple mutations um, whereas uh, tissue is uh, more likely to only show one. Uh, on the left, then, we have patients arranged vertically uh, with their previous TKI therapy along the top and the development of uh, resistance mutations at the bottom. And um, again, this can be potentially used to identify uh, certain TKIs that may have more, more or less activity against certain mutations. This data can also be looked at longitudinally. Along the top, you have a patient uh, with EML4 ALK fusion that's uh, maintained throughout the course of disease. Uh, on progression on electinib, developed two resistance mutations, or sorry, first uh, ALK L1196M mutation, and then on lorlatinib, developed G1202R mutation in conjunction uh, uh, likely to be leading to some resistance. The patient below shows a more complex um, uh, timeline, uh, also instructive on electinib, the resistance mutation V1180L developed, which then responded to brigatinib. However, on brigatinib, G1202R developed, uh, which then responded to lorlatinib. Uh, the patient then became resistant again with the addition of another mutation, C1156Y. So this was my best way to uh, collate this information and something of a cheat sheet using uh, this mostly anecdotal data to suggest certain treatments of choice. Um, if no mutation is found or uh, a mutation not listed below, then lorlatinib uh, tends to have the broadest activity. Uh, for G1202R, um, lorlatinib has shown the most activity, although in combination with other mutations, lorlatinib uh, may also be uh, not active. Uh, these mutations, 1171, 1180, and 1196, uh, all do uh, likely have some sensitivity to brigatinib, although it's certainly variable. There are these uh, interesting mutations, L1198F, and this compound mutation that are thought to uh, be associated with a resensitization to crizotinib uh, uh, or uh, to bertinib and brigadinib in the case of the second compound mutation. Uh, and then there are certain uh, compound mutations which are thought to have pan-TKI resistance and therefore chemotherapy should be strongly considered. So how do I put this all together? Again, beginning with the clinical factors, oligoprogression, if it's CNS only, stereotactic radiotherapy or whole brain irradiation, if there are multiple sites of CNS progression uh, and continuation, continuing with the TKI is appropriate. 
Um, I also was able to find this experience with dose escalation of electinib to, to 900 milligrams BID reported by Justin Gaynor. Um, if the progression is oligo progression, but outside the CNS, stereotactic, stereotactic body or radiotherapy, as long as the patient's continuing to feel well, uh, continuing the same TKI, I think, is, uh, is perhaps a, a very optimal way to proceed. Multi-site progression, in this case, I certainly uh, do use CTDNA to identify resistance mutations. If CTDNA is not um, diagnostic, I will consider a, a CT-guided core needle biopsy for testing. If mutations match uh, one of the specific TKIs, as I just listed, I will select that one. Um, but if it's G1202R or or otherwise, you know, not uh, not otherwise specified, treating with lorlatinib, uh, you'll see that lorlatinib is often uh, one of your options. But I do find it to be one of the more um, one of the TKIs for ALK that has more toxicity. Therefore, if a drug like brigadinib looks like it may also be effective, I'm often choosing that preferentially. And it's also very important to remember uh, that, that if there are, are, is evidence of significant progression of disease uh, with rapid increase in pain, uh, weight loss or fatigue, um, or if a patient's already received multiple prior TKIs. For me, that's, that's often two prior TKIs. There are some, some uh, physicians that, that may often go to three TKIs. Um, at that point, strongly consider a switch to a chemotherapy-based treatment. Those options include carbo pac bev atezo or carbo pembro although we don't have specific data. Um, uh, I think that would also be considered um, an option for ALK positive disease. Um, and there are some that are using carbopem and continuing the TKI if brain metastasis control is an a ongoing and present issue uh, based on anecdotal data uh, uh, to continue the CNS control. Here's the NCCN guidelines, which uh, more or less uh, follow um, what we just reviewed. And there are, there are some more agents that come, and trectinib and ansartinib have both uh, been suggested to have uh, meaningful activity, although um, uh, less is known uh, pa with patients progressing on uh, second generation drugs. Uh, Repotrectinib and uh, belazatinib, um, as well as all these other agents, also are uh, uh, undergoing further study. Allosteric inhibitors. Uh, may be um, different enough that we may, again, find a significant benefit even late in therapy, but those are uh, a while away. And new combinations, um, some studies of TKIs with bevacizumab or co-inhibition with um, other agents are also being uh, further evaluated. Thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure to speak with you, and I look forward to your questions.